All right, so we'll get started. Um, if you'll notice, I'm putting up a number of video links here that um, I hope will be helpful. Okay, so I wanted to just show you one, I think a good example of a Wernicke's aphasia. Remember, this is also called a fluent um, aphasia because if we just have a lesion in Wernicke's area um, and Broca's area is working, then lots of words will be coming out. And that's often our biggest distinction when we see someone with aphasia. Um, it, this patient's very verbose, so that tells us Wernicke's area is intact. Um, listen for paraphasic errors, these words that don't make sense. And uh, remember also, it's helpful just to realize that things are usually not 100% in neurology. So maybe let's just say 70% of his Wernicke's area is not working. That means, you know, a little bit he's going to understand. Okay, but it becomes pretty obvious that he's quite impaired as we watch the video. Okay, sir, could you tell me your name? My name is Rudolf Reyes. And uh, could you tell me uh, what brought you to the hospital? When I was at the uh, thing together, I was with the uh, uh, easy tip. Did in other words, uh, they, they were uh, perf perfect or, or easy, and we all got together. Okay. We were in the uh, in the record pictures. Sir, could you tell me how old are you? I was uh, 20, year, 20 years old. How, sir, how old are you now? Today I am now 89 officers. Okay. 89 officers. All right. I'm ready to try to go any place I can go. Okay. Sir, I'd like to see how much you understand what I'm saying to you. Yes. Um, could you hold up your right hand? Can I what? Could you hold up your right hand? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I Could can ride. I can All right. do everything. Which is your right hand? Uh, which, which is uh, the even? Okay. The, well, uh, a lot of uh, Germans. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, th this is what I really got. But I'm 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 a day good now. I can get up. I can run around. Good. And I'm a, I'm a 98. All right, sir. Could you close your eyes? Close the what? Could you close your eyes? What do you mean close the eyes, Trey? Can you close your eyes? From see the people? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I let's, could let's if see I you wanted that. to. Yeah. Okay. Could you do that? <laughs> yeah. Can you close your eyes? Yes, I would. Okay. Sir, let me see if you can identify a couple of things. Uh, what is this I'm holding up right here? What do you call this? A pen. Oh, say that what again. For? What do you call this? A pen. A pen. Okay. Yeah. Good. You couldn't do that yesterday. That's uh, that's encouraging. What are these? This is a tech tech heaver. Okay. Uh, it's a good paraphasic error. There. What uh, you have for your cars? Yeah. What did you call them again? I know you use it now, but it's a, 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 a pedery. Pedery? Yeah. Okay. And, sir, what are these right here? It's a... a it's a... a, a can of pita. Okay. Well, maybe I won't, <laughs> maybe I won't have those. Uh, I, I think I'm going to keep those. But. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, that's just a good example of a uh, Wernicke's aphasia. Um, now, the other thing is uh, several people have asked, and I think it's a good question, um, how about other function? Like if, if we ask, uh, let's say, a patient with a Broca's aphasia, um, how can they write if they can't speak? And usually those things are affected in parallel. Okay, so the, the speech output is affected, but also their ability to get words out on a page is usually affected to the same degree. Um, okay, so let's move on here to cranial nerves. Okay, we'll spend the least time on the olfactory nerve. Okay, so we have the olfactory nerve fibers here uh, entering through the cribriform plate. Okay, and we've seen already in lab the olfactory bulb and tract. Okay, and so 
the result of this is that especially with head trauma, those olfactory nerve fibers can get sheared off pretty easily. So that's one of our more common causes of loss of smell if someone has, is involved in a significant accident um, and will notice some loss of smell um, in the recovery process. Okay, so remember olfactory bulb and tract, and we've talked about the uncus as primary olfactory cortex. All right, so how do we test this on exam? Usually we have, um, I have in my office these scratch and sniff cards. Okay, and so you'll have a patient occlude one nostril, and you can assess smell in each nostril. Uh, we don't check this in every patient, but uh, if someone has a head trauma, that might be a time to assess. Um, a tumor called a meningioma, tumor of meninges, um, we'll talk about next year, tends to grow in certain areas, and one of them is right at the base of the skull, right next to the olfactory bulb and tract. And so these patients will complain of headaches and loss of smell. And so anytime someone's coming in saying, I've, I've lost my ability to smell, well, that's the time to get out your scratch and sniff cards if you have them. All right, so headache and loss of smell. Uh, not that this is common, but uh, might lead us to think about a tumor growing in that location. Next year, we'll talk about Parkinson's disease, and more than 90% of patients that have Parkinson's disease have loss of smell. It's part of the condition. All right, and, but most causes of loss of smell is not neurologic, all right? So probably most of you have noticed if you had a significant upper respiratory infection, you may have loss of smell in that setting. Um, smokers tend to have loss of smell. So frequently this is not neurologic. And um, all right, not that this is super important, but just a practical point. We usually don't check this. So when you do your routine neurologic examination, you're going to write cranial nerves 2 through 12 intact because you didn't check the first cranial nerve. Okay, but I'll just tell you, if you think you might be involved in a legal case, um, then we check the first cranial nerve, okay? Because this is actually a, a very mean tactic of uh, lawyers uh, for neurologists, so now we're all aware of this, that, uh, you know, in court, well, doctor, did you do a complete neurologic examination? And you proudly say, yes, look at my notes, I've got the whole neurologic examination there. Uh, well, did you tech check the number one numero uno cranial nerve? And you try to explain, well, this is not really relevant, not important, and you know, try to make you look foolish. So if you think it's a legal case, then we always check the first cranial nerve. All right, so here's a meningioma growing right here at the base of the skull. Okay, and so as that grows, it will cause some headaches, and the patient might have loss of smell. All right, now smelling salts. You've seen these used like for boxers or to try to alert people. So it releases a pneumonia gas, and we're not checking sense of smell here. This actually irritates the trigeminal pain fibers. Okay, so um, we're not checking smell there. We, we don't do this very often, but um, just that you're aware of that. Okay, this is the cranial nerve here that uh, is stimulated in that process. All right, the optic nerve. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. Remember, we've seen the optic nerve in lab, optic nerve, optic chiasm. <coughs> and we will follow this back now and show you the rest of the anatomy of how vision gets back to the occipital lobe. All right, so there are four things that we can do on examination to assess the optic nerve. First is visual acuity. Uh, you've all seen the eye charts in the doctor's wall, so check visual acuity. Uh, visual fields, I'll explain what that is in just a minute. Um, we can look in the eye. This is the only part of the central nervous system you can actually see on the neurologic examination. When you take out your ophthalmoscope and you look in the eye, you can see the optic nerve head right there back in the retina. So that's very helpful. And then the pupillary light reflex, which assesses both cranial nerves 2 and 3. All right, so visual acuity. I won't say much about this. We, uh, when you're in the hospital, um, you'll all have a little card that has the Snell and eye chart, and you can hold this a certain distance away from the eye um, to assess visual acuity. Okay, for neurology, we're interested in the nervous system, not the refractory components in the eye, so we always want to check corrected vision. We want the patient to have their glasses on. Okay, and so visual acuity is an assessment of macular or central vision. All right, and this We'll take a little explanation here, but 
only lesions anterior to the chiasm affect visual acuity. All right, so if we have lesions further back of the visual system, and we'll go through this anatomy in just a little bit, those do not affect visual acuity. And so here's just a little drawing. I, I should have put this in your handout that a student created some time ago. Um, so here is the retina. Here are the visual fields, what the patient is seeing. Everything gets flipped around. We'll, we'll explain that in a minute. But I just want to point out one thing here. Um, we'll talk about what retinal fibers cross here at the optic chiasm in just a little bit. But let me just point out that right at the center of the chiasm, these fibers right here are macular fibers. And essentially half of your macula crosses at the chiasm. So our central vision for visual acuity, half is going to stay on the same side, half is going to cross over. Okay, And it turns out that if you lose half of your macular fibers, let's say that we have either a lesion of the optic tract here or on the other side, half a macula is good enough for 20-20 vision. Right, so it's only when we have lesions up here in the optic nerve or the retina in the eye that will destroy enough of the macular fibers to affect visual acuity. Okay, so if a patient comes in complaining of visual loss in one eye and their visual acuity has plummeted, we're never going to put the lesion back here. Okay, the lesion is going to be anterior to the chiasm. Well, 90 I don't know, 95 plus percent of the time. The only way it could occur from a lesion back here is you'd have to have bilateral lesions, right? Because you're needing to knock out more than 50 percent. All right, so the optic nerve here, can you notice it's white here? And we don't see it like that over on the other side. So this is an MRI scan showing a patient that has inflammation of the optic nerve. Okay, and this is called optic neuritis. And this can occur from a number of different things, but by far the most common cause is multiple sclerosis. We spend a whole hour on multiple sclerosis in the second year. But in a nutshell, multiple sclerosis is a condition where we have central nervous system demyelination. Okay, and the optic nerve is a central nervous system pathway. It's myelinated by oligodendrocytes, just like other central nervous system pathways. And so the optic nerve is affected then in a condition like multiple sclerosis. So again, the lesion here in the optic nerve, um, these patients come in with visual loss in one eye, their visual acuity um, plummets, and they usually have a loss of central vision. That's called a central scotoma. And so again, imagine trying to look at an eye chart when you can't, your central vision is knocked out. Okay, so severe loss of visual acuity. And uh, fortunately, these patients tend to have a real good recovery. So we'll say more about optic neuritis later, just as one example of an optic nerve condition. The other way we check optic nerve and really the entire visual pathway is what's called visual field testing. And in visual field testing, we want to line ourselves right up with the patient. So we're looking right at them. And we'll ask the patient to cover one eye, and you will cover the corresponding eye. So if they're looking at me, they're covering their right eye, I'm covering my left eye. And then I'll ask the patient to look at my nose. And while they're looking at my nose, um, I'm holding up fingers and asking them to identify how many fingers I'm holding up. Okay, that is called the confrontation method. And it is preferred, you will learn about this, the finger wiggle method, where you have a patient, same thing, look at your nose, and you say, tell me, can you, when can you see my fingers coming in? Okay, And that's helpful, but the confrontation method, where my hand is just still, and all I'm doing is holding up fingers, is preferred um, just because the retina is so sensitive to motion. And so a patient can even have visual loss, but they will see the movement. Okay, so we want to just keep our hand like this and hold up fingers, and we check all four quadrants. All right, so let's just look at what we're testing here. So we have the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic tracts. We'll see this in the lab um, hopefully on Monday. Remember, any sensory information going back to the brain has to go to the thalamus. Smell is the only exception. And so there's a specific thalamic nucleus 
for vision. And then from here, the optic radiations convey vision back to the occipital lobe. So remember, primary visual cortex or striate cortex is back here in the occipital lobe. All right, one other thing to point out from this um, drawing here is we talk about a nasal retina and a temporal retina. The nasal retina is the medial portion of the retina. The temporal retina is the outer portion of the retina. And so um, as a kind of a fundamental starting point, you need to ask yourself, okay, which, what vision is crossing, what isn't crossing? So notice that the temporal or the outer retinal fibers do not cross. Okay, they stay here on the same side in the optic tract and back to the occipital lobe. Whereas the nasal retinal fibers here cross in the optic chiasm to the other side. Okay, and we could do the same thing over here. So the outer retinal fibers do not cross, the nasal retinal fibers do cross. Okay, that's really the key bit of understanding. Okay, so um, before we say more about the anatomy, again, just to point out the optic nerve, the optic chiasm. So again, this is where the nasal retinal fibers are crossing. And then if we do some cutting, we can actually see the optic tract right here. And this nucleus right here, notice it has a Napoleon's hat shape. Okay, if you've seen pictures of uh, paintings of Napoleon, this is the thalamic nucleus that is important for vision. And this is called the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the lateral geniculate body. Oops, someone asked me if I could use the cursor. So there it is, the lateral geniculate, and there's the optic tract. And from there, vision gets back to the occipital lobe through the optic radiations, which are right here. Okay, and so primary visual cortex is back in this area. Okay, so again, striate cortex here, and primary visual cortex is all around that. All right, now, we'll spend a little time here with this um, drawing. And so we've talked about the retina, that the temporal retinal fibers here in blue do not cross, the nasal retinal fibers in kind of yellow-orange do cross. But now you need to ask, okay, what does the temporal retina see? What does the nasal retina see? And so um, if I am looking straight ahead, and something is off to this side. So imagine that vision coming into my eye. Okay, in the right eye, it's going to strike the nasal retina. In my left eye, as I'm looking straight ahead, light is going to strike the outer or the temporal retina. Okay, so the nasal retina sees the temporal visual field. The temporal retina sees the temporal visual field. Okay, so... Here it is here. Um, if we imagine the patient, uh, this is the right side, so the right temporal retina sees this visual field out here. The nasal retina is going to see the opposite side. So if we just stick with vision that's off here to the, let's call this the left, okay? So again, that strikes the contralateral temporal retina, the ipsilateral nasal retina, and all of that, all of this vision is eventually in the opposite optic tract, right? Because the temporal retina doesn't cross, the nasal retina does cross. So the significance here is once we are behind the optic chiasm, all vision on the opposite side has crossed. So if this is the left optic tract, this is all the vision off to the right that you're seeing. If this is the right optic tract, it's all of the vision off to the left that this is processing. Okay, so let's explore that here just by going through some lesions. Um, if we have a lesion of the optic nerve, like optic neuritis, well, that's pretty obvious. That's going to affect vision just in that eye only, right? So if we have a lesion of the optic nerve, so this is called a prechiasmal lesion. The lesion is, you know, before the optic chiasm. So this is the left side. So the patient's going to have visual loss in the left eye. Okay, and we call that monocular vision loss. The lesion is just in one eye. So if you see this, you know, you shouldn't be putting the lesion back here. The lesion is very anterior.
Okay, now this is probably the most, af most often asked board question of this whole anatomy, not that we actually see this very often. I think I've seen two cases in 22 years or so in neurology, but if you have a lesion of the optic chiasm, okay, and remember what's near the optic chiasm? Pituitary gland sits right there. We saw that in the lab um, earlier this week. So compression of the optic chiasm, what's the visual loss going to be? Well, what crosses in the optic chiasm? It's the nasal retinal fibers. Okay, what does the nasal retina see? It sees the temporal visual fields. Here are the temporal visual fields. So as that vision comes in, it strikes the nasal retina. And so therefore, patients with an optic chiasm le lesion have what's called a bitemporal hemianopia. Hemi is half. The, and uh, hemianopia, this describes visual loss. And so if you see a visual pattern like this, the lesion can only be at the optic chiasm. Okay, let me just stop there. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so we have a lesion here, monocular vision loss, bitemporal hemianopia with an optic chiasm. And so all of these lesions, three, four, five, six, seven, um, the visual loss from any lesion behind the optic chiasm is only going to result in some sort of visual loss in the opposite or the contralateral visual field, right? Because everything is either all vision in this whole pathway behind the chiasm is seeing the opposite visual field, all right? So lesion three here is a lesion of the optic tract, Okay. Now, if you were just to completely cut the optic tract, then this would be perfectly symmetrical. And uh, unfortunately, most review books show this as uh, extending all the way down. So it's perfectly symmetrical side to side. But almost always, optic tract lesions are not identical side to side. And so we call this incongruous, meaning the visual loss is not perfectly symmetrical incongruous homonymous hemianopia. And so the reason it's not usually s perfectly symmetrical side to side is that in the optic tract, these visual fibers are rotating a lot. And so because of, you know, they're not just in a static position. Once we get back to the optic radiations, they're not rotating or moving. They're just traveling straight back. Because of all of this rotation that's going on, lesions here tend to produce uh, visual loss that's not perfectly symmetrical side to side. So if we see this kind of an incongruous lesion uh, suggests optic tract. Okay, so again, the lesion's on the right. And when you look at this, you need to imagine now the patient's looking at the screen, right? So the visual, uh, correct, I should say, he's right or left. Um, so if the lesion's on the right, the visual loss behind the chiasm is always going to be in the left visual field. So it's just the pattern of visual loss that will um, help us to localize things. Okay, now the nucleus right here, um, which I'm not going to give an example of that. This is the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, we have an hour on neuro-ophthalmology next year. Next year we'll talk about lesions of the lateral geniculate, but it's kind of complicated, so I'm going to skip over that. But here are the optic radiations traveling back from the lateral geniculate. And so lesions of the optic radiations can occur in a couple of different places. And what happens is from the lateral geniculate, the optic radiations just kind of s expand through a large portion of both the temporal and the parietal lobe. So number five are these optic radiations that loop down into the temporal lobe. And this is called Meyer's loop. And this tends to be a, um, a smaller uh, part of the optic radiations here. And so, again, the lesion's on the left. So as the patient looks at the screen, what you're seeing here is the lesion in the right visual field. And with a, a left temporal lesion, this produces what we call a pie in the sky. It's a little bit smaller than a full quadrant. Okay, so it's a homonymous superior, because it's the superior visual field, quadrantinopia. Okay, so if you see that, the lesion is in the temporal lobe. Yes? Well, 
okay, so the, the patient's looking at the screen, so this is what, the, to the patient, this is what their vision in the left eye looks like. And so they've lost this quadrant of vision. In the right eye, this is what the patient can't see. They can't see this little segment, and it's superior. So as the patient's looking ahead, they've kind of lost this little quadrant of vision. When Dr. Kirby gives you a lecture later on, he will tell you um, about his experience with a lesion in the temporal lobe, and he actually has this superior quadrantinopia. All right, so it can be a little dangerous then if you're driving or doing things like that because you've kind of just lost a little pocket of your vision. Now, the next lesion here, number six, are the optic radiations that are traveling back through the parietal lobe. And these tend to be larger, and so it's the rest of this that is lost. So again, the lesion's on the left. As the patient looks at the screen, they've lost this larger segment of vision on the right side. Okay? Now, if we were to completely destroy the optic radiations, and so number six is usually a middle cerebral artery stroke because the middle cerebral artery uh, supplies all of the optic radiations back here, then you get this tends to be quite symmetrical homonymous hemianopia. Okay, so here are the lesions on the left, and so the patient has a pretty severe loss of all vision to the right side. Okay, and then the last one I'll tell you about for now, number nine, is a lesion back here at the uh, occipital lobe. And so very often this is due to a posterior cerebral artery stroke. Remember we said the PCA supplies the occipital lobe. Okay, and so this just looks like the last one. So the lesion's on the right, so as the patient looks at the screen, they've lost vision to the left. But there's one unique thing here, which is that the macular fibers um, back in this area actually have a dual blood supply. The MCA supplies the macular fibers and the PCA supplies the macular fibers. So this, what we call macular sparing right here, um, is only seen with a PCA stroke. So if you ever see that this, it's a PCA stroke. And this is just because of uh, the macular fibers are protected by the middle cerebral artery. Okay. Now, if we have an MCA stroke here, okay, remember that looks like that. There's no macular sparing. And the reason is that everything, including the macular fibers, are traveling through here. The PCA doesn't supply this area at all. So in this area of the optic radiations, we don't have that dual blood supply and we don't have macular sparing. Okay, so this is a distinctive feature for PCA stroke. Okay, question, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. How would you check this up out on physical examination? This is actually fairly difficult because these macular areas, it's just, it's pretty small. We actually have to take out a tiny little red pin and what we do is we go back and forth. Is the, can you see it here or here? Here or here, here or here? And it's right down the midline, except right when you get to the central vision. And then there's a little pocket of preserved color vision. That's how we check it. Okay, so we will say much more about that later. Now next we go to the eye exam. And for me, this is the most difficult part of the neurologic examination. Um, it took me years into residency to really feel comfortable with this. So in the third and fourth year, I'll just you know, preach here a little bit that when you have a chance to look in the eye of a patient, um, do it. Because you need to look in a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of normal eyes before you get really good at this. Um, so Dr. Shankel gives you several hours on the eye exam. And so I'm just going to kind of tell you a couple of things. This is a nice normal eye exam, um, retina and optic nerve see a nice distinction between the optic nerve and the retinal fibers. And so a couple of important things that we look for in neurology. Um, remember when there's increased pressure in the brain, there are very few places for that pressure to go. But one of them is to push forward against the optic nerve head. And so when we have a tumor or hemorrhage or something like that in the brain, it's very important that we look in the eye for what's called papilledema. And can you see, compared to the normal eye here, just look at the optic disc. It's congested. 
We don't have that nice distinction um, here between the optic nerve and the retina. All right, so this is called papilledema, and whenever you see this, um, it's an emergency. You know, the patient has increased intracranial pressure. Okay, so anytime someone comes in, let's say, to the emergency room with a headache, this is a very important part of the examination. You need to look in the eye. If you see papilledema, this patient needs a brain scan. Okay, another thing that we look for is what's called optic nerve pallor, and this is a kind of a bright whitish appearance of the optic nerve head. Okay, and this occurs with any lesion of the optic nerve over time. This is due to atrophy of the optic nerve, and then the, it has a white appearance. So uh, optic neuritis, the one condition we've talked about so far. It, you know, someone with MS, if they have a really bad case of optic neuritis, maybe they don't cover, recover completely, and then we look in the eye and we can see some objective evidence of damage to the optic nerve. Okay, and then finally the pupillary light reflex, which remember is two cranial nerves that we were assessing here, two and three. And so the size of the pupil is dependent on two things, sympathetics and parasympathetics. Sympathetics are always wanting to dilate your pupil, okay, especially when it gets dark, your pupils dilate. Um, the parasympathetics want to constrict your pupil, and that's especially with light stimulation, your pupils want to constrict. So we've got this kind of tug of war here always going on with the pupils. Let's talk about parasympathetics first of all. Okay, so now we're looking at this, the visual pathways, not in terms of visual acuity, but in terms of what's happening with the pupil. So when light comes into the eye and goes back to the optic nerve, um, some of that light is going to cross at the chiasm. Okay, again, that's especially the nasal uh, retinal. Some of that light is going to stay on the same side here as the optic tract. Okay, but to um, the third nerve, remember, is the nerve that's involved with parasympathetic. So light here, either that's crossed or uncrossed, is going back through both optic tracts, and it stimulates an area in the midbrain called the pretectal nucleus. Okay, and we can see that is right adjacent here to the superior colliculus. Okay, now we have a crossing here. And unfortunately, this is not labeled, so maybe just add this here to the diagram. This is the posterior commissure right here. Or maybe I put that in the handout. I can't remember. But anyway, the point is that light actually has a double crossing. Um, some is going to cross at the optic chiasm, and then we get another crossing back here at the posterior commissure. And so the parasympathetic nucleus that's really important here is the edinger westphal nucleus. Okay, you need to know, remember the name of that nucleus, edinger westphal nucleus. This is the parasympathetic contribution to the third nerve. Remember, the parasympathetics want to constrict your pupil. And so when light stimulation here uh, activates the edinger westphal nucleus, then these parasympathetic fibers here travel with the third nerve okay, out to constrict the pupil. And the ganglion that it talks to along the way is the ciliary ganglion. Okay, and then out through the short ciliary nerves and your pupils constrict. So notice then the normal reflex. If you just shine the light in this eye, you are equally stimulating both edinger westphal nuclei, which means that both pupils constrict symmetrically and strongly. So when you shine the light in one eye, both pupils should constrict. So that's the normal reflex. And so all of these things on the neurologic examination, I mean, when someone rolls into the emergency room unresponsive, there are a number of things we can do quickly. Shine the light in the eye, both pupils constrict. Well, that tells us a lot. It tells us that cranial nerves 2 and 3 are working, and it also tells us that this area of the midbrain is working. So we're, we're getting the nervous system to talk to us uh, and give us some information. So the posterior commissure is just this small little area right here. Okay, right above the dorsum of the midbrain. Okay, we'll see that in the lab um, on Monday. All right, by a less uh, poorly understood connection, the pupils also constrict during accommodation, which is where on examination, if you just have the patient follow 
your finger to their nose, or you can just ask the patient to look at their nose. The pupils constrict when you do that. All right, so this is a different pathway. And here, unfortunately, the only drawing I can find, they've flipped the midbrain around from the other orientation. So um, don't get confused. But here we have light coming in, and they've only shown what's happening on one half of the midbrain. Okay, and so light comes back to the pretectal nucleus, the Edinger-Westphal nucleus is stimulated, and the pupil, pupils constrict. And if you want, just draw the same thing here on the other side to be consistent with the last uh, drawing. But now this pathway shows you uh, what happens to the pupils during accommodation. So this involves vision, right? You're looking at your finger as it's coming to the nose, and so the occipital lobe is going to be involved in that. Okay, and to my understanding, this pathway is not very well understood, but the occipital lobe also connects with the pretectal area, and it's by a different route, different mechanism. Okay, so pupillary constriction to light and pupillary constriction to accommodation is different. And so we will, um, in this course, talk about lesions back here, which will tend to affect light um, the effects of light in constricting the pupils that is sometimes not affected in parallel with pupillary constriction to accommodation. Okay, so this is just the normal neuroanatomy and later on we'll, we'll talk about lesions back here and how we have kind of a disconnect between these two um, pathways to the pupil. Okay, sympathetics, we've been over this pathway already that are continually wanting to dilate um, your pupils. Okay, so this is a three-order neuron chain. Starts in the hypothalamus. Goes all the way down through the brain stem to the spinal cord here. Okay, and the, I had the student that drew this for me to just highlight the lateral medulla. That'll be important as we go through brain stem sections that this travels through the lateral medulla. The second order loops over the lung around the subclavian artery up to the superior cervical ganglion. And notice that the superior cervical ganglion, the fibers that are going up to dilate the pupil, uh, it's really complicated, okay? And I will not ask you about the details of all of this. All this is anatomically correct, but what I would like you to know is that this third order pathway from the superior cervical ganglion dilates the pupil, and it also supplies a minor eyelid elevator called Mueller's muscle. The major eyelid elevator is the third nerve, okay, but the sympathetics here has a more minor effect at eyelid elevation on Mueller's muscle. Okay. The third order pathway here also, just to blood vessels and sweat glands, heads off here with the external carotid artery. All right, so if you have a first order lesion or a second order lesion, then that will affect both blood vessels and sweat glands and the pupil and Mueller's muscle. So we'll get our complete triad here of a Horner syndrome. And so notice here that this patient has a smaller pupil than the other side, and we've got a little bit of ptosis. Okay. And if the lesion is first or second order, then this patient may have some loss of sweating as well. That's called anhydrosis. What's really helpful when you see someone like this, because it turns out almost one in five people have slightly asymmetrical pupils. If we were just going through each one of you, it wouldn't take long before we'd come to someone with asymmetrical pupils. So sometimes you're wondering, well, is this significant or not? And so the best thing to do is just to turn the lights off. Well, you need to be able to still see the pupils, but dim the lights, okay? And so what happens? Well, the sympathetics kick in when you dim the lights. And so in the normal eye here, the pupil dilates. Okay, here we have a sympathetic dysfunction. We have a Horner syndrome, so the pupil can't dilate. So dimming the, the, the room lights will bring out that pupillary, pupillary asymmetry is really helpful. Quick thing to do at the bedside. Now we're convinced. This is real. Okay, so there's our triad of Horner syndrome, meiosis, ptosis, and hydrosis if our lesion is proximal to the superior cervical ganglion. And so we talk about lesions. These will come to later in the course. So if we have strokes in the brain stem, um, sometimes lesions in the cervical cord, that would be a first-order lesion. Uh, second-order lesion, 
Okay, I told you I'm going to give you the five most often asked board questions here in first year neuroscience. So here's number two, which is an apical lung tumor. Okay, so this is a pancos tumor. So this affects a second order pathway. Okay, and so if this is usually going to be a smoker. Okay, so if you see a smoker that has a Horner syndrome, it's lung cancer until proven otherwise. And then the third order lesion would be something that is affecting the carotid artery. And there are some headache syndromes that occasionally during the headache, the patient may have um, a Horner syndrome. Okay, let's get into eye movements a little bit. So there are three cranial nerves involved in eye movements, three, six, and four. And so the third nerve does most of it, okay, except for the fourth nerve, which supplies a single muscle, the superior oblique, and the sixth nerve supplies the lateral rectus. Third nerve does everything else. So uh, helpful maybe to, to remember SO4, LR6, third nerve is everything else. All right, so this is a correct diagram to show you the major action of the different eye muscles. Medial and lateral rectus are easy. Medial rectus pulls the eye to the nose. Lateral rectus abducts the eye. Superior rectus and inferior rectus have to do with elevation, especially when the eye is in the abducted position. So in my right eye, if I'm looking up like this, that's superior rectus. Down will be inferior rectus. And this is often when um, all hell breaks loose in this course because there's often confusion about the oblique muscles. Okay, but um, we'll explain here a little bit about the superior oblique. All right, so here's a nice drawing that a medical student did a few years ago to show you the action of each of these um, extraocular muscles. So let's, let's deal with the superior oblique here first of all. Um, now when we're talking about a superior uh, eye muscle, we're looking down on top of the right eye. If we're looking at the inferior rectus or inferior oblique, you need to imagine you're looking up um, at the, from the bottom up on top of the eyeball. So here we're looking on top of the right eye. And so here's kind of the pulley action here of the superior oblique. And so the strongest action of these muscles is always when the muscle is aligned with that, that spe specific direction of the eye. So for example here, we're looking on top of the right eye, and so notice that when the eye is adducted, when the eye is looking to the nose, that the action of the muscle is in line here with, with where the eye is looking. So this is going to be the strongest action of the superior oblique. That's a little asterisk it's right there. Okay, so the strongest function of the superior oblique is when the eye is looking to the nose, and then it very strongly pulls the eye down towards the nose. It's a pure depressor down to the nose. So we can just see if you pull this, the eye is just going to get pulled right down to the nose. Now the further the eye AB ducts, okay, so um, now the eye is AB ducted. So we're looking down on top of the right eye, so the eye is looking out laterally. Now notice if we pull this muscle here, that there's going to be a rotation. Okay, we call that intorsion or incyclotorsion. Okay, so if we're just talking about my right eye here, as I look to the nose, the superior oblique acts as a depressor. As I look out further laterally, now it acts to intort or encyclotort the eye. Okay, they're both down and towards the nose. But one is just a pure depression, the other is more of a rotational movement. Okay? And there's confusion about this. Um, and uh, it's interesting, in the March, the American Academy of Neurology had their week-long meetings in Los Angeles, and I did all of the neuro-ophthalmology lectures. They were fantastic. And I decided I'm going to ask every <laughs> lecturer, uh, do you know that students often learn that superior oblique is down and out? And I have to say, everyone was puzzled. Is that what? Are you serious? That's very unusual. And I think it's because in anatomy, if you just look at the eyeball in a petri dish and you disconnect all of the other extraocular muscles, then you do see some down and out movement. But that's, I think, clinically uh, not relevant at all. All right, so let's talk about then what would happen with different lesions 
of these cranial nerves. If we have a third nerve palsy, the third nerve acts, remember it does everything, right, except for SO4, LR6. And so what happens is, since the third nerve also supplies the major eyelid elevator, levator palpebra, third nerve palsy, the patient has severe ptosis. Not the mild ptosis of the Horner syndrome, but a severe ptosis. And the eye gets pulled out by the lateral rectus. Okay, and if you look at the videos, I have a, a uploaded a video of a patient with a third nerve palsy. And if the fourth nerve is intact, remember I told you when the eye is abducted, the fourth nerve in cyclotorts. And when you're checking eye movements, you can actually see the eye do this. That's the function of the fourth nerve when the eye is abducted. Okay, the third nerve, we've already just shown you the anatomy via the Edinger-Westphal nucleus that this constricts the pupil. So if you have third nerve palsy, you lose that. Now the sympathetics are overacted and you get a, a blown pupil, dilated pupil. Okay, that's called mydriasis. So this is what a third nerve palsy looks like. In the end of the second year, you will know five causes of a third nerve palsy and how to distinguish them. For now, um, we've just briefly talked about these two. Remember, uncle herniation, the uncus is right next to the third nerve. Okay, And the posterior communicating artery is very close to the third nerve, so if you have an aneurysm there, when it ruptures, uh, it'll compress the third nerve. Okay, These other three we'll cover later. If we have a sixth nerve palsy, okay, think of the medial lateral rectus normally being equally kind of yoked here. So if we have a sixth nerve palsy, the lateral rectus is now weak, and so the medial rectus just pulls the eye towards the nose. Okay, so if you look at a patient like this, this would suggest a sixth nerve palsy, and of course it would be helpful then ask the patient to look this direction, and the right eye would look to the nose, but this eye would just kind of get stuck here in the midline. Okay, and a fourth nerve palsy. Uh, fourth nerve palsy, um, patients will usually tilt their head to the opposite side to try to bring the images together. And let me explain how that works. So we've shown you the action here of the superior oblique. And, uh, well, here's the Bible of clinical neuro-ophthalmology. And so here's their, uh, in case you didn't believe me, here's their summary. So in primary gaze, the superior oblique acts to depress and to entort. Okay, when the eye is abducted, it's purely in cyclotorsion. Okay, but the strongest action is, is when the eye is looking to the nose. Adduction, it's depression. And so they say that depression becomes essentially nil when the eye is abducted. Okay, so do not think of the superior oblique as a down and out um, kind of a function. And here is your textbook for the course, Kendall and Schwartz, all saying the same thing. So here's a patient that has a left uh, trochlear neuropathy. Okay, and when she looks straight forward, um, you don't notice a whole lot. What we will notice is that this eye is always in a slightly elevated position. That's called a hypertropia. And it's not real obvious here. Now notice when she looks to the right, that now we see a real obvious disconjugate gaze. This eye is elevated. So we're losing the depression action of the superior oblique when she looks to the right. Okay, when she looks to the left, it's not so obvious, but the left eye is always in this more upward elevated because we're losing that downward tension of the superior oblique. And when she looks down, we can still see that this eye is more um, elevated. Okay, but what really helps to nail this down is to have the patient tilt their head from one side to the other. Okay, and what I would encourage you to do is look in the mirror when you get home, fixate on the mirror, and tilt your head back and forth. And just look at what the eyes are doing. When you tilt your head to the right, um, this eye needs to incyclotort, and this eye needs to excyclotort in order to fixate on something. And so when she tilts her head to the right, remember the lesion's on the left, um, this eye, when you tilt your head to the right, needs to excyclotort to fixate, and that muscle's fine, right? Remember with the fourth nerve, it's in cyclotorsion where the problem is. And so now what happens when we have her tilt her head to the left, okay, now she needs that in cyclotorsion of the fourth nerve to be functioning, 
And so tilting the head towards the side of the lesion brings out a very obvious, uh, we call it a disconjugate gaze. The eyes are not lined up. Okay, and so this is what a fourth nerve palsy looks like. And so these patients walk around with their head tilted all the time, tilting to the opposite shoulder. And oftentimes these are kind of, patients don't remember exactly when it came on. And so um, I will often have patients bring out their driver's license, bring out older pictures. And some of these individuals will have this for decades and they're always walking around like this a little bit. And they weren't aware that they're doing that to, to try to overcome uh, double vision. Because if this nerve isn't working, then patients, things aren't lined up perfectly. There's a little bit of double vision and the head tilting helps. Okay, so we'll say more about this uh, next week. Thank you.